Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Sloppy Lab. Um, welcome, welcome. I am JT Russell, and uh, don't let the name fool you. This guy's always got my six. It is quick draw, <laughs> three, four, five. <laughs> the elusive six. The elusive got six. Got yours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Happy Tuesday. Good to be here. Good evening and happy Tuesday. Nothing like a Tuesday without a bottom of the beaker. Absolutely. And, yeah, uh, and I'm on a streak now. Um, I've made it for more than two consecutive weeks, I think. The streak is You're real. You're vibing in, uh, in a mysterious beaker of liquid. <laughs> um, We're seeing the, the, the science, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. And I, I have some tea of my own now, too. So I, I don't have a nice, fancy um, thematic mug, though. Yeah. I'm I'm very proud of this mug. I just arrived. I think this is my first episode with it, but it's going to be a uh, mainstay. I think it's not a beaker. I am uh, I'm ashamed to say it. it is technically a flask, but we are nothing if not fly, uh, sloppy. <laughs> so we'll uh, does it have a logo on it? Is that is that some branded <sighs> stuff right there? It doesn't have a logo, but I should I should kind of etch it in or something. That would be. You're all about the branding. I assume mm. that you had branding on your your flask as well. It's coming. <laughs> It's coming good yeah yeah um welcome fudgenator welcome data forge stream thanks guys for joining um this is going to be one that uh, i think you and i are very excited for and uh i think fudgenator might be excited too um i, I think he likes dark tidings i'm not sure <laughs> i've never heard him really give a, a full opinion on it before um so i'm not sure how he feels about it Hard to say. Maybe we'll see some comments uh, <laughs> trickling in with the DT hate from the from the chat. <laughs> Although, yeah. this, joking aside, this might be some of the highest concentration of DT love uh, around. So we're going to yeah. do our best well, to play devil's um, advocate along the way, too, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, like I really want to give... Uh, so we're going to talk about Dark Tidings, obviously. Um, the good, the bad, you know, the ugly. Some ugly, I'm sure. Um you and I both really like the set. I think, I don't know, I don't want to like put you on the spot, but I think I like it more. I don't know, I'm not, not putting you down at all. Um, huge fan of the set. You and I actually tried to find someone to join the show who does not like Dark Tidings. And we found one person and they couldn't make it, but literally one person in the world does not like Dark Tidings and they couldn't make the show. So you and I, we're, we're going to have to make up for it. We have to be a bit more fair and balanced with this. Tide goes in. Tide comes out. Can't explain that. Can't explain that. So um, we're going to do our best, though, to kind of um, talk about like what people like and don't like about it, try to give an honest take on it, um, and maybe come to some conclusions at the end as well. So um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's going to be fun, though. We know that much. It will be fun. Absolutely. Um, so let's start with the Tide going in. Uh, and... Uh, would have been nice if the tide going in coincided with the good things about DT, but we're gonna we're gonna stick with we're gonna stick with the theme and kind of build up to the good stuff. Um, so I don't know what do folks dislike about DT. Let's kind of explore this. Um, uh, and you know, we kind of got off to the on the wrong foot with DT in the community. I feel like from the very beginning, like even before it was really in hands widespread, there were haters, kind of. Uh, on Twitter, on on the discords, kind of saying maybe it wasn't super competitive. Um, I feel like there was even a comment or two that w that said something along the lines of like, yeah, there's never going to be a, a event that you know a DT deck that's going to win a vault tour or something like that. I was very close, yeah. quick draw to uh, to to calling this person on a bet at the time. Wish I did, but <laughs> it's like, how do you disprove it too? It's kind of one of those uh, it only ever pays out if you win. <laughs> well, not only that, it was said during the pandemic when there were no vault tours mm -hmm. so it's like okay i mean wasn't exactly a bold prediction but now that we have vault tours coming back someone has to win a vault tour with the dark tidings deck i know i know one deck that can do it i have a deck that i like to think could do it on a good day um but that's going to be an interesting one i remember that tweet as well and uh that one got some play but you're right like the set kind of got off to a really bad start from the beginning. If you remember all the delays in production, like I think there was just a lot of community frustration just over things in general, like not just the cards, but there was a massive delay. Um, there was like the rumor that the uh, the ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal <laughs> was carrying dark tidings, and that's why it was delayed. Yeah. Like all kinds of stuff happened that year that was just nuts in, in 2021. 
And um, when it finally got into the hands, I think it was first released in Europe. So Europe got it a few months before the U.S. Um, the Italian community is very big. I'm sure they enjoyed it while they could. Uh, but the U.S. community, I think, got pretty antsy. Um, I actually bought a few decks from Europe before it was released in the U.S. Hmm. Um, so I was excited for it. Um, but like you said, there were some people that would see it and didn't think that it had the power level that other ones had. And I think that was really like the first impression was set came out. And I think instantly people were like, this isn't as good as mass mutation, which is, you know, a very high bar to meet. And I, I think that definitely started people off on the wrong foot. Hmm. Yeah, no, I, I kind of agree with that as a, as a recap of how things went down. Um, unfortunate to, to kind of have that as the, as the initial taste though. I maybe maybe this will be a thing that we, that we also look at as the tide goes out, but I'm not sure if necessarily meeting that, meeting the bar that mass mutation set in terms of, in terms of raw power is a thing you want to do set over set. Um, I don't know. I mean, do you feel like that's a fair characterization? I think we should probably ask ourselves if some of these kind of negative, negative opinions of the set or, or, or uh, criticisms with the set are, are legitimate or what, how, to what extent they're legitimate. I mean, do you think it's fair to say that DT is weaker overall in general or just with respect to mass mutations uh, in particular? Well, I mean, I love the set and I think it's objectively weaker than mass mutation on the whole. So yeah, I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to dispute that. Um, I think it's underrated in some aspects and I think it, it attacks in different ways in the game mm -hmm. that maybe we'd only ever seen before in AOA because AOA has some very weird niche like matchups that it can exploit that like really good Coda or even Worlds Collide decks can't. And I think Dark Tidings is kind of similar. Um, and while Dark Tidings may not have some of like the, the top end Saz monsters or even like the, the vault favorites that other sets will have, I do think that its decks more often than not can stay competitive in a game that um, you might not think it could keep up in. Um, and I think as a, as a game player, if you like strategy and, and you like um, decision-making, I think that's like really the best you can ask for. Like as we play our game later tonight, and I think anyone that plays with dark tidings, think about throughout the course of a game, how many decision points you have and mm -hmm. how many like, different options you have on some given turns like you and i played a game last night a warm-up dark tidings game for this and i realized like on turn three maybe i had like i think i probably could have called any of the houses that i had and each one of them would have drastically changed the game mm -hmm. and you have to make that decision and it could make or break it but i think when you think about all of those decisions that you have to make in a dark tidings game i i personally think that there are more of those in dark tidings than other sets and then you think about like at the end of the game, like maybe you lose three to one, but then you have to think about all those different decisions that you had to make during that game. There's so much more room for error. And so you can't just say this deck is weaker because it can't keep up in these matchups. There are definitely cases where I think um, I've made, you know, five, 10 errors throughout the course of a game and ended up losing like three to one, or maybe like I barely forged my second key. And, you know, I think that those decisions compound more in dark tidings and it has a higher ceiling but also potentially a lower floor in performance during games. Mm, that's interesting. And, uh, you know, this is a characterization that I've put out, um, for, you know, very broad strokes from some of the past sets. You know, one of the reasons why I really like AOA, I mean, AOA is my personal favorite set, Dark Tidings I would put at number two. Um, you know, when I look at Mass Mutations or, Mass Mutations or Coda, uh, or excuse me, or Worlds Collide, um, I do feel like there are important decisions to make in there, but I do feel like it's, very often one or two big swing turns or one or two big, very impactful uh, decisions that end up deciding the outcome of the game versus um, some, some more incremental ones that will compound. This is a broad, broad characterization. Um, I, I tend to make the analogy of, you know, home run derby versus Moneyball. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, Mass Mutation World Collide feels a little bit like home run derby, whereas AOA and uh, Dark Tidings feels a little bit more like Moneyball, and you're trying to trying to compound some of these smaller decisions, make these good value plays. Um, again, there are like there are obviously the big combos, the big flashy combos, um, but maybe 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 the big home run uh, derby style uh, style decks really appeal to folks too, and that's a little bit where a little bit of uh, the flashbang was didn't land 
in, when DT was first kind of hitting shelves. Yeah, I like the Moneyball comparison. I think it definitely feels true because you're you're playing small ball, really. You know, you are you're not trying to set up a turn where you have like you know six amber gained from a vault's blessing or um, you know an archive full of fifteen cards where you just dump out a bunch of creatures or something like that and, and mark of dis someone. Like the set's very different than that. Like one of the things I well before I get into things I like about it and and the money ball, because I love that analogy that you made with it. Um, mm -hmm. Let's talk more about that, like, in, sure. in the next segment. But here, like, we're talking about the complexity of decision making. And Data Forge Dream has a good question here. Like, you know, do people not like those decisions? Do they like the simplicity of Coda or even the earlier sets? Like, you know me, like, I've talked a lot about <laughs> within our team about how Coda to me is, like, very simple. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> Not tonight doesn't take very kindly to that usually because she does have some really interesting Coda decks that I'm not saying that Coda is just like you never make decisions with Coda because it's not true, but it does have a really nice simplicity and elegance in design. And by the time you get to Dark Tidings, there is some complexity and like let's differentiate between depth and complexity. I think there is both here. And I think it's mm. one of the negative things that people could say about it is that the complexity is a bit too high, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, so for me personally, I think that's that's a fair that's a fair criticism, or at least it's a fair thing to say, a reasonable thing to say. I think that Dark Tide, and while I love Dark Tidings, do think that it starts to creep up a little bit on sort of the the board complexity, as it were. And this is this is maybe a thing that shows up in other sets as well. But I think that I really like having lots of strategic depth. I think that there is a ceiling on what's a reasonable amount of kind of. Uh, board complexity, um, just just sort of like how much thinking you ask somebody to do before figuring out you know what key cost is going to be next turn. At some point, that stops being like a strategic kind of uh, element of the game. It starts being well, this is just bookkeeping, and I made an arithmetic error. Um, that's less interesting to me. Um, but you know, this is not something that's necessary. That necessarily dark tidings has a monopoly on. I mean, my number one my number one uh, offender on this list, I think has to be Cloaking Dongle. Um, the people, the, the creatures next to the creature wearing Cloaking Dongle, like I know they have elusive, you know they have elusive, I'm going to forget they have elusive every single time, <laughs> you know? Uh, 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 and so I think there's there's a little bit of like how much, how many things am I gonna ask folks to keep track of on board um, uh, before it stops being you know, like interesting tactics and starts being uh, like, oh, I don't know, verging on dangerous analysis paralysis territory where you have to like, you know, double check everything before you make an attack, right? <laughs> yeah, I yeah. think that's legitimate. And so we have a number of decks that we've queued up to kind of illustrate some of this stuff. If you could pull up Guadalupe for me right now, mm -hmm. um, Fudgenator knows I love to talk about Guadalupe. We <laughs> talked about it last week, but it's a, it's a good example of this because um, Guadalupe has a uh, two techno babbles in it so that uh, stuns a creature and each of its neighbors that shares a house with it so you want to make sure that you don't have your houses stacked up next to each other against techno babble mm -hmm. and then it has an infighting which is uh, you want your probably want your small to big left to right so that nothing will die theoretically or you want to like stagger it with your armor in the middle so it doesn't take damage things like that there's a lot of decision making with the infighting mm -hmm. uh, and so trying to balance those two things the infighting and the techno level together is kind of a lot to think about it at one time and um, another example would be grand grand melee you know, like if you're facing grand melee and techno babble then like what do you do you know like pick your poison. Um, you have to kind of predict what house they're going to go into and what cards they've already played and things like that. Um, so that does definitely add to the um, like the bookkeeping that you have to make, as you put it, during a game. And maybe that's not interesting to some people. So, so those, I think, are actually great. I love love those elements. You know, how I'm, how I'm situating my, or setting up my battle line to optimize for an infighting or versus techno babbles. Like those are, those are great. Those are great things. It's something you, you think about long-term when you just look at the board and you're trying to figure out what's going on. It doesn't necessarily factor in. Um, I think I mind more. Okay. I'm just looking at the board, not considering what you might play, what's left in your deck, anything like that. I just like, okay, if I pass the turn, do you forge or not? And if I attack, does this attack actually like deal damage or not? Like those are the sorts of things where I think you have to be a little bit more careful as a game designer on how many of them mm -hmm. you stack up. Um, 
Nah, the inviting it, te techno babble one, I actually really enjoy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think this has more of that element too. Then, like this deck also has a cheetah, mm -hmm. so it's like that one and its neighbors gain elusive if the tide's high, and then it has the um, the combo we talked about last week, which was the Hydra Cataloger and the Tide Warp. Yep. So if you're calculating key costs, there's two eddies. There's the Hydra Cat, and there is the um, Tide Warp. Uh, there's also like the static collection array and, you know, there's so much calculations that go on each turn just to see like, is this creature elusive or will you forge? Will you gain from mecha buoy? You know, um, I think this, this deck is like, I really enjoy this type of style, but I know a lot of people don't. And this deck is like chock full of those things. And so I could definitely see it being, um, kind of a negative playing experience for some people if they're like, well, I don't want to have to think about like you're raising the tide at the start of your turn and then you archive and then Eddie costs an extra one. And, you know, like there's just so many things going on there and I can kind of understand that, but I do think that Keyforge had that, that room to grow in mm -hmm. this regard. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that this was a great step in the right direction for that. And maybe, maybe others, maybe others think that it didn't need that, that there's enough complexity to the game already. And, you know, um, we all love this game. It's a great game. I think it had, it's a great design. That's why we're all still playing it. Um, but I historically have always preferred games with more complexity and depth than what Keyforge offered in the first few sets. So like, to me, this is like a step closer to, you know, like what I really love about gaming. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the, uh, the kind of turn-based nature of it, um, I think really does benefit from some of that, that extra complexity, like you were describing. I mean, we, we don't want turns that, I don't think anybody would, would say, hey, I want a turn where it's obvious which house I should call and which actions I should take, right? I think having having puzzles in there, feeling like you found that that really one line that, you know, was just, you know, so cool and, and got you to the third key that was, you know, got you to check for the third key when nothing else would or, or got you out of check when all hope looked lost. Like finding those things should feel rewarding and should should be difficult at times right uh, if it's not difficult then you know what are we doing here <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah i mean yeah. if anyone could do it then what's the point you know like how is how is it enjoyable sure. as a game um i think the biggest thing that we hear the biggest complaint um is about the tide mm. as a negative thing mm -hmm. um a lot of people don't like the tide and i think it's probably largely due to the chains but i also think it's due to perhaps you know, most of the cards that exist in the set that relate to the tide, um, you can just raise the tide before you need to use them anyway. Um, there is a very short list of cards that your opponent, as a non-Dark Tidings player, would have to consider raising for, and that list is like four cards. You know, it's like, pretty sure it's just Mecha Bui, Dry the River, uh, Medicus Lacus, Static Collection Array, um, and that's it. Those are literally the only four. That you have to like an immediate have to raise to take away a benefit from them that they cannot just simply raise during their turn to get back mm -hmm. like and dry the river is like kind of a weird one because dry the river you need to have the high tide to reap right. so um i do think that people raise more often than they should like if you have a chelonia out and i'm thinking like i got to turn off that chelonia i'm going to raise the tide only for you to just go next turn and play all tied up or cross purposes <laughs> and get the Chelonia anyway. Like, so I think that's a feels bad moment, but you know, it's also a game playing mistake. I would, I would argue um, the four cards that I mentioned earlier, I think are literally the only cards that as a non dark tidings player, I would take the tide for, because if it's meaningful enough for them to have their Chelonia or to have, you know, um, a together that plays two cards instead of one, like they'll just raise before they need to use those. Um, and you're not really hurting them as much by forcing them to take three chains because you as the first person to take those chains in that like decision space there mm -hmm. are getting the, the immediate like downside of that. Um, and so I think it's going to hurt you more it's than it's going to hurt them, especially if they uh, have tide raising cards of their own, which a lot of their tidings decks too. Um, it's an interesting segue because I think a lot of other people complain that, well, I have a Dark Tidings deck that needs the Tide and it has no Tide Raisers. Mm -hmm. Is, do you think that's like a design flaw or do you think that's a problem? Like, what's, your, what's your take on that? This is a tough one for me because I would put it 
in the things that are good about the set. But I'm going to put on my hat, my octopus hat. I don't know if you can see. Uh, <laughs> um, That's your omnipus hat. My omnipus hat, indeed, indeed, uh, of the folks who who would hold this opinion, because you know what? It's it's a it's a it's a it's a legitimate feels bad moment when you open a deck and it's got twelve things in it that want the tide and has you know zero or one tide raisers. You're just like this deck has you know, three to six chains baked in, uh, it's kind of, it feels kind of crummy. And like, mm -hmm. it, like, sure, that, that feels, that feels bad in a sense. Um, that's, if that's the deck's good enough though. Like I, I've had a few decks that I thought were like borderline good decks, mm -hmm. but then I see they have no tide raisers and I'm like, ah, that kind of, kind of cancels it. But if I had a deck that was a monster and was total fire and used the tide a lot and had no tide raisers, Mm -hmm. I'm not just dismissing that deck. Like you can survive that, you know, like um, it's only a major like factor. If it, the deck is already like kind of eh, pretty good, has some holes to it. Oh, but never mind. I have to take chains all game. Then like, then it's like, okay, it's probably not good enough. So we had a little bit of, you know, a little bit of a discussion in uh, with some of the other, other content creators. This was actually pretty cool. I wish, uh, Wish it was one that the community had a benefit from too. But Ketzer had some uh, some interesting notes about different archetypes that may be specific to Dark Tidings. And I hadn't heard these terms before, so I apologize. Uh, yeah, but I want to make sure they, they kind of get credit for it. But um, uh, Tide Riders, and oh, I'm blanking on the other one. So there's one where it's like, I, I want the Tide Tide all the time. Uh, like doing all this great stuff. Life's great when the tide's high. You know, playing your strange mm -hmm. ordinations. You're rocking your Chelonias. You know, life is good when the tide's high. And then there's the ones that really benefit from the tide going back and forth. And if you've, like, I have decks with, like, triple strange ordination. And if it's, like, like one tide raiser, you're like, oh, man, <laughs> like, come on. Yeah. But, I mean, it's not the end of the world. I think you'd, I think you'd be a little bit frown town if you had a double, triple um, mecha buoy deck and no tide raisers. <laughs> you'd be like, well, well, shoot. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, it's, this happens in, this happens in other sets like i have i have dark amber vault decks with like four mutants five mutants yeah, you know there you I, go I or know. like vault's blessing with like three of them you know like things like that that happens mm -hmm. uh thank I you think, uh tide riders and tide neutral as well so there's tide warping decks tide riders yeah. tide neutral from ketzer don't know if uh, this was their their or og terminology or not but uh but really cool L liked them a lot mm -hmm. yeah me too um and I think the tide warping that they talked about a bit um, also leaned on using things like Espeon because the more that you can raise and lower, and you know, you get more value out of them. Mm -hmm. um, Binary Moray was another one they listed. Hydra Cataloger, um, but it, those kind of decks really add value to the Builds Warden as well and Tidal yeah. Wave. Like I've definitely had decks where I look for Builds Warden and Tidal Wave to take advantage of that. Like especially if you have a Seneschal Sargassa, for example, and you're constantly fighting and like taking keys away. Like I have a really sweet um, Sargassa. I think it's a double Sargassa deck, maybe triple and Whirlpool. And um, it gets crazy because everyone's just going to like raise and capture four and put it on the right flank and then give it to you with the, the Whirlpool. And everyone's doing that back and forth all game. And you're playing hot potato with like multiple creatures. And then you draw into the tidal wave that this deck has. And suddenly you gain the upper hand with that battle because you can raise to capture, you tidal wave to kill, you lower it, and you put them back wherever you want. And they most likely don't have a tide lowering card. So there's like weird interactions with, with tide warping decks like that that I just love. And uh, tide, tide war it's named tide warping for the tide warp card. And Guadalupe also takes strong advantage of this, of like having the low tide and the high tide and um, knowing when you need to have each of those so yeah some really cool um insight from ketzer on their opinions on the tide and things like that um mm -hmm. i really like that yeah do you think do you think it's fair to say in general that there's a lot of a lot of relying on synergies in dark tidings maybe more so in some of the other sets like i would i would say that mass mutations mass mutation just has really high card value like card for card just like very strong cards and you know describing decks that rely on you know some bilge warden coming down at the right moment 
Does, is there something fair fair to say there that maybe maybe we have more decks that are relying on on these synergies, um, and that being something that could that could turn people off a little bit? It could be. I think um, I think Dark Tidings has some combos as well. So there's like combos, and then there's synergies. So um, combo could be like a library card data forge deck, which I've seen a few really good ones. You had one up on this on the uh, the background here to start um, mm -hmm. last mother tiger or something like that it's it's a really crazy library card combo deck um but if we're talking about um synergy is like i first thing i think of is whirlpool like if you get a whirlpool deck um then you're looking for very specific synergies with it otherwise the whirlpool is just like a card that adds more complexity and you're not really taking advantage of it some games you might be discarding it depending on what your opponent has if you don't have like that full set of synergy so um, there are things like that that I think definitely do rely on a higher synergy that you need for it to function. And that could be, you know, it could be a downside, you know, like, um, I don't think those are really, you know, the highlights. I don't think those are really like the, the marquee decks in the set. I think those are really niche things, um, that they're not for everybody. You're going to find a few of them that are pretty cool, maybe pretty strong. Um, but I think really like what, especially since it follows mass mutation, people look more to the value, like you said, like mass mutation has more higher mm. value synergy where like, you know, the swing of having uh, a vault's blessing with 15 mutants or a dark amber vault with 15 mutants or, um, you know, things like that, the value you get from that kind of synergy is way higher than you would get from whirlpool with a bunch of capturing. Mm. Mm. That's fair. Interesting. Interesting. Maybe some, so maybe maybe fewer kind of very splashy haymaker type effects. Um, interesting. Yeah, I think um, we'd be remiss to not mention the chain aspect of Tide. You know, yeah. like I think people don't like the slog, and you're going to talk a bit later, I believe, or maybe even now if you feel like it, about um, adaptive and chain bidding, and you know why do people not like chains? I think that's definitely a factor here as well. Like they're like, I don't want to play my deck with five card hand the whole game, or maybe even a four card hand. Mm -hmm. So like to me, to those players, like raising the tide all the time and drawing fewer cards is just not fun. They're playing fewer cards, seeing less of their deck. Yeah, playing fewer cards, playing fewer cards on its face does sound like a less fun proposition, right? Your your the idea, the mechanic is boils down to less key forge for you right <laughs> in, in some sense i mean depending on your lens we're, we're kind of playing devil's advocate a little bit but i will also say that dark tidings as a set in combination with some uh some very crafty teammates have won me over a lot on adaptive and chains in general um so i i have a whole have a hard time arguing for this one as well i think my my own feelings on kind of chains and adaptive have shifted a lot in the last year or two um so it's tough, but I, I get where folks are coming from uh, well, who do not enjoy chains. I think it's a perfectly fine opinion to have. That, and if you just find them less fun, like, okay. I I've, guess I've found a way to uh, embrace them at, at low levels especially. Um, but I don't know. What's what's your take? Do you, do you, have you, are you at peace with chains? Think it's bad, bad, bad of the game? I'm very much at peace. I, I, do, I, I often don't even notice that a lot of Dark Tidings decks that I play only have five card hands. <laughs> and I don't know if that's just like me not paying attention or like it. having fewer cards in my hand, to me, does absolutely not detract from the game experience at all. Mm. Um, so and do it's you a feel decision, like, you know, like... Yeah, uh, sorry to cut you off. Did you feel like, um, do you feel like it enhances the inherent variance in the game? having fewer cards or, or having high chain counts? That's a really good question. Um, I think similar to a lot of the other effects, and I, I was talking about decision-making with Dark Tidings earlier, mm -hmm. I think raising the tide to have a benefit is a decision point for anyone, whether you're playing Dark Tidings or, or not. And if you need to draw to an out, uh, or you, need, you know you need to find like your submersive principle before the end of the game, like your opponent's rushing and you know you need to find that submersive and you don't know where it is. Maybe you think twice about raising the tide to take three chains for some extra amber with Chelonia. Maybe you, um, maybe you're just careful about, you know, all the decisions you make to lead up to that until you find what you need. So like the, the key to me is that like 
you have the choice. It's not like your opponent says you gain three chains and you take the tie. Like it's your choice. And if you don't want to take those chains, you don't have to. And sure, some of your cards might not be as good. Like Chelonia, if you have a low tide, is weaker than Hunting Witch. Yeah. Um, but I love that you have to make choices. And what's more than that, I love that Dark Tidings, more than any other set, makes your opponent make choices. Like mm -hmm. You talked about this being a, a turn-based game, and historically, Keyforge is always like, I make all the decisions on my turn, you make all the decisions on your turn. And Dark Tidings introduces so many things that say, I'm going to play a card, and you need to make a choice. And it gives your opponent the chance to make a mistake. This is one of my favorite mechanics in any game. When you're playing a card, your card, and you're giving the opponent a choice in it. It's like, I just love those decisions and the situations that it puts you in. And you think like Illusions of Grandeur is a great example of that. It is it is literally like control the weak done right. You know, mm. it's like, I'm going to pick your house next turn. You can, you can pick something different, but I'm going to get three amber for that if you do that. Um, it's just, I, and there's a lot of those cards that are in Winds of Exchange too, like that give your opponent that choice and i really hope that or and i think the dark tidings was a way to kind of like take that next step in design for keyforge mm. to kind of explore this broader world and i really think that um if you don't like dark tidings i just want you to at least consider and appreciate what it does for the future of keyforge from a design perspective because i think it really opens things up a lot like before this you know it was more straightforward playing simpler cards and just kind of straight value like here's just like I, I mentioned vaults blessing a lot i don't know why it's on my mind so much but it's just it's just a really good card and if you're not playing mass mutation it's like i gain five amber you gain nothing you know like there's not a ton of like skill in that like you can definitely set it up and maximize it but if you're playing against an AOA deck that does not have Neutron Shark and uh, Archivist, what's it called, uh, Researcher Smoko, then like that Vault's Blessing is straight value. There's no downside to it. But then when you get to Dark Tidings, you look at all these double-sided artifacts that affect both players and that can give your opponent a benefit if they take advantage of it. Playing those cards out, to me, is like... That's just excellent game design when you're like... I'm going to play this and you might be able to take advantage of it. And you have to make that call. Like, is my opponent going to take more advantage of this card than I am? And maybe discard it like final analysis. When I first looked at final analysis, I thought the card was insanely good. You play a single game with it and you're like, Oh God, this is terrible. <laughs> but then there are some <laughs> decks that really want it. And so you have to make that decision and understand when is the right time to play this card? Mm -hmm. And when is it going to just help my opponent more? And that opportunity to make a mistake, I think is, is like a really really good thing in design yeah i i couldn't agree more i mean control the week 100 percent a better card in my book than illusions but illusions 100 percent a better design in in my book um and i do i do agree that i love what i love kind of the direction that it represents for the game i think it uh, affords for more interesting decisions and I mean, just thinking back in my own experience, I've I've definitely gone both ways as the illusioned person, and handed over that three amber, or taken a bad turn to not hand over the three amber, and it's mm -hmm. it's not always been a very clear decision. And I'm sure I've gotten it wrong. I think that's uh, I think that's a good thing, a good thing for for yeah. the game. What it says about the game. Yeah. Yeah. So we've played devil's advocate for 36 minutes now, but there's one more thing that I do want to touch on before we go to the next segment. Um, and that is the impact of SAS because, and I'm not, I'm trying not to like dismiss the thoughts. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> uh, share some of that bourbon. Um, I'm not trying to dismiss the, the dark tidings detractors as simply being biased by SAS. But I think, you know, we have to look at this from like, cognitively speaking, you open a deck, a box of Dark Tidings and you get everything in the 60s or 50s. It feels bad. Mm -hmm. That's it's why I um, eventually tried to learn some self-control and open like one deck a day out of a display. Because I just felt crappy if I opened a whole box and nothing had a high SAS value. And I was like, ugh, now like, you know, what do I do now? I, you know, because I think we just look for that adrenaline rush of like opening an 80 plus deck and you're not going to do that with dark tidings unless you are extraordinarily lucky 
And that's just kind of a symptom, I think, of SAS. Like, if you understand the limitations of SAS, it'll make more sense why Dark Tidings is not as highly rated. But I think it's just, and again, I'm not trying to dismiss the opinions of people that don't like it due to SAS. I think it's absolutely a factor, though, as to why some people don't like it is because they don't get anything that's highly rated. Yeah, I'd agree. Um, yeah, I'd agree. I mean, uh, uh, I was going to draw draw a corollary with AOA, but it's probably fair. <laughs> it's probably fair. <laughs> it's similar to AOA in that regard. I mean, mm -hmm. we mentioned probably a month ago in the show, we were talking, um, like, what if Dark Tidings had the number of decks opened that, mm -hmm. like, not even Coda has, but, like, AOA. Like, could you imagine some of the crazy stuff I think we'd see in Dark Tidings if we had, I think it's, what is it, like almost 10 times more decks opened in For Coda than, than DT, I think, yeah. Coda than DT? Okay, I forget the numbers are, but it's it's a very high number. Um, we've seen so little, relatively speaking, of Dark Tidings compared to the other sets. Like, I think that also kind of colors the opinion of as well. You're like, well, none of these decks are good, but like, sure, we've had like 10% of what we've had from some other sets like mm -hmm. i think there could be a lot more stuff that popped out if there was more opened of it mm -hmm. yeah yeah and i i hope we i hope we do i don't know what the print runs look like for dt currently um, but i would love to see some more dt running around out there yeah i have a box on the way um i am keeping a collection of a sealed display of each set and i actually my dark tidings in my closet right now is an italian one and the rest of mine are english so I did say like, all right, I'm going to just buy an English one for the collection and I'll be cracking open the Italian one. Maybe we can uh, pop some decks on stream here in a week or two for some Dark Tidings love. That would be fun. That would be fun. Take some notes from Data Forge Stream who does that <laughs> weekly. I do like it. Um, yeah, Fudgenator DT mostly sold out. I, I think it's, you can still find it. You're not going to find it discounted right now, but um, I think it's completely gone from Italy, if I'm not mistaken. Um, or that was mass mutation. Dark tidings might be as well. It is hard to find though, and it's not cheap either. So yeah, it's hard to find. You're not going to find the you know twenty dollar displays like your you know the lottery ticket type decks that you're getting for AOA. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, <clears throat> I have opened I have an embarrassing amount of AOA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard to resist when it's twenty dollars on Amazon. You're just like, you know, how can I say no to that? What What can you do? Um, but yeah, we we uh, we were looking at this uh, the other day. I've opened, I've opened more dark tidings than I have uh, mass mutation or coda. Yes, yeah, so, that's impressive. Yeah. yeah, very impressive. Even including um, the mass mutation fire sale decks, I've opened more dark tidings. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The fire sale for mass mutation is what put it on top for me. Um, dark tidings is second though, among decks open for me, which uh -huh. is. Uh, considering the Dark Tidings has very rarely been discounted, like I've spent a lot of money on Dark Tidings. I must like it. It's, it's a good set. Some would say. Yeah. Some would say when so, the tide goes out. <laughs> tide goes out. Um, we're gonna talk. You know, we've talked a lot of already about like we couldn't resist ourselves really about what we've liked about this set. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything else that we haven't mentioned yet um, that you really like about Dark Tidings? That I really like or, or really. Uh, dislike. That you, oh, positives like oh. tide is going out now. So tide is going out. For some out reason, now. we we associated tide going out with positive <laughs> parts of dark tidings. It's a meme, folks. Just go with it. Yeah. Um. So we we've hooked in the dark tidings haters now by talking about how bad the set is for forty minutes. So now they're going to listen <laughs> to why it's it's great. Yeah. Uh. So, I I really do like that dark tidings. Uh. I really do like the kind of puzzle aspect that it that it, it feels more like I, I'm actually making meaningful decisions through my turns. Um, I think we talked a little bit about kind of the money ball versus home run derby. I feel like I'm making more decisions that matter throughout the course of the game, um, whereas maybe in a mass mutation world to collide world, there are absolutely decisions that matter, but they're usually very large and, and obvious, um, gross generalization. But I think that in sort of the dark tidings and you know AOA excluding Brig Jenka type nonsense, um, you see a lot more of these these grindy games where you're cobbling together advantages, incremental advantages through kind of synergies that you have to discover and, and carve out um, to kind of amass a amass a winning advantage. And I find that 
I find that very rewarding, and I think it's something that um, Dark Tidings really offers and really does well. You know, when I look at some of the decks that I think of as being very good Dark Tidings decks, you know, I think of Anakim, for example. I mean, the Shadows in Anakim does a lot of work, and there's not really, like... I mean, okay, you see the rooftop lab, and you're like, wow, it's got this cool combo, but I think really the Shadows is what's was what's excellent and puts that deck over the top and it's things like scooped you know <laughs> that are scooped is so good yeah it's, but i mean <laughs> it's, it's really insane um if you could pull up anakin so the viewers here can see what we're talking about with this it is a, a rooftop lab deck like you said it has um i think three scooped and two mug and it has tons of bursts in the untamed um but the interesting thing about it is that everyone always looks at the Feroctor combo, and they're like, oh, it's a Feroctor deck. But I, I'm not lying to you. The Logos in Anakim is the worst house of the three houses. And the groundbreaking discovery like can go off for sure. Um, but like you said, that Shadows, like having six, seven cards right there that are straight up removal, and five of them have an Amber Pip on them. And um, the you know, those five also have like a potential to gain even more from that. Like there's so much going on in that shadows. Um, it, I think it, it would not work without it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, the creature control is relatively low, but it has the ability to easily handle witches mostly because of the shadows, which yeah. is like, I think a key thing. Um, um yes, yeah, so you probably not. I mean, maybe you worry about, big dino boards going going nuts but that might be a matchup mm -hmm. where you're maybe angling toward that rooftop lab combo a little bit more maybe uh have i ever told you how thankful i am for word of returning in this deck? <laughs> i mean if if not for word of returning this would crumble i think to a lot of sanctum and sarian and sanctum is not usually seen at, at high tables but you know it's still there capturing with big bodies is is tough for this deck to handle um, but the word of returning is a total game changer. And you can just try to archive that, find it, save it for the right time when they've got like, you know, Scudum on something and like six amber stacked on it or whatever it is. Um, that may not work if it kills it, but like if they have like a Tribune Pompotus and everything they have is like a 30 power, um, you know, that's amber you're never going to get back if um, you don't have a word of returning. So it's it's huge. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, the first well, card we've mentioned that is not a Dark Tidings specific card. Yeah, word word for turning. What a fun card! It's yeah, oscillates between eh, random pip with no text versus complete game changer yeah. in a matchup. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure. Yeah. Um, you were talking about Moneyball, and Moneyball is a great comparison here. If we could touch on that a bit more. Mm -hmm. Um, Homer and Derby. I think you're. Are you talking about like combos? Or are you just talking about like just straight value? No, I, I do mean more com more combos and just very very powerful linear type strategies like the 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 world's collide archetypes to me are the some of the dominant ones. It's like these these decks trying to line up runaway board states with the big uh, Saurians and Star Alliance dudes, and it's just like well you know if if you get this big old board and there's nothing I can do about it, then you you reap for a whole bunch and maybe you've got dinos capturing a lot and they're forging with amber on your dinos and everything's warded it's like well you hit it out of the park and i uh, i don't know i didn't have any playing outfield in the stands so you won yeah um whereas yeah. you know if you're lining up scoops and wallops and you're and you're man you're having to worry about how your um how your battle lines placed like i i think that this is even just case in point i think it's one of the first board based sets where i really worried a lot more about how i actually managed my battle line I mean, in say Worlds Collide or Mass Mutation, I mean, you, you worry about leaving Taunt Flakes open and you, you feel kind of silly if your Drekker is placed awkwardly. But mm -hmm. Kind of Eclipse, you have to think about. Yeah, like... there, are, there are a few cards here and there. Yeah. Um, but I think it's really, really rewarding and important uh, and actually kind of impactful uh, to, to the end result how you manage your battle line in many Dark Tidings matches as opposed to it being an edge case. Um, so I think some of these decisions that 
feel like they ought to be important when you kind of are learning the game and are, and are hearing kind of how, how things are, how things work actually do matter. And I think that's, that's good. That's a good thing. Um, yeah. And something I enjoy here. I think a uh, huge missed opportunity. And I, I bet the designers of dark tidings probably regret this too, is they left out armory officer. Nell, not now um, tactical officer moon from dark tidings. Tactical officer moon would be an incredible card in dark tidings mm-hmm. to rearrange a battle line however you want maybe they thought that was too easy i don't know but i've i definitely wished that tactical officer moon was in in dark tidings for a lot of decks um it was it's always like a like you said like in older sets like battle line doesn't mean a whole lot like sure you gotta like cover a taunt you know like that's pretty much all that tactical officer moon does in older sets is like uncover a taunt or you know put someone on a flank for very specific reasons mm-hmm but that card would really shine, I think, in Dark Tidings, or at least against Dark Tidings decks. Yeah, I think Scally Caper would have been an interesting addition as well. Is Scally Caper Dark mm-hmm. Tidings? It's not, is it? Uh, right? Yes, he is. Oh, well, that, good on them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, Scally Caper is. Um, yeah, mm. we talked about Whirlpool, like a, a big card that you have to watch your flank and your battle line. Like, that's a really intense one. Whirlpool's, so Whirlpool's funny, too. I think... Uh, so it's Whirlpool, Auto Encoder, Fangtooth Cavern. You're just really into decks that encourage you to discard all your creatures. <laughs> Don't tell people to discard with Whirlpool. They're going to let out my secret. Yeah, I mean, just... you should probably discard. Uh, there's some games with Whirlpool where you like, you should discard all your creatures. But then mm-hmm. there's other times when you just need to know when to flood the board with them. Um, it can go either way. It can go either way. And there's very often an inflection point in the game where it makes sense to switch. Uh, I think Whirlpool is interesting, too, in that it's almost always correct for at least one of the players to be discarding all the creatures. Maybe not both. In fact, mm-hmm. in fact possibly not both, um, but at least one. And and evaluating that and figuring that out is interesting, whereas uh, with Fangtooth Catherine, it's a little bit more clear. Um, against 3x Mark of Dis, it's a little bit more clear, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But, no. um, I, I had a hilarious game. I think it was Swindle Team event. <clears throat> Uh, I want to say it was the Morai, Team Morai. And um, I was playing a Whirlpool deck, and my opponent was playing a Quicksilver Stone deck. And sure enough, <laughs> it was like turn two or three, they were both on the table. And uh, they had, uh, I think it was Cornice and Octavia, and then I dropped an Amber Vac on it, and Chaos ensued. And that was the only creature played the entire game. It was just because <laughs> <laughs> you can't play a creature. The most hilarious part about that game was that my opponent had, or no, I, they were playing my deck, I think. And I was playing their deck. And so they had the Whirlpool. I had the Quixel. Um, they had like six R in that deck. Like tons. Just, I, I have some weird Whirlpool decks that have so much artifact control. It's weird. But um, they had two Gorm of Alms and two Molly Mocks. And I, I think I vandalized one of the Gorms early. The second Gorm was buried. He was not legally able to play the Molly Mock because of the Quixel Stone. <laughs> so like every turn, I would pass the creature, the only creature in the game, back to him, and he can't play the Molly Mock. And it was just like, it was hilarious. Like, I'm never going to forget that game. I don't know if they share the same experience <laughs> as I do with it. <laughs> it was just like, I had a blast. And um, one of the first things I looked for after Whirlpool, because I, I contacted Ghost Galaxy directly just to ask about Whirlpool in, in um, Winds of Exchange, and it is in there. Uh, I also looked for Quixelstone, and it's also in there. And so I can't wait to find a really cool Quixel Whirlpool deck in Winds of Exchange. Well, I hope it also has that, uh, what, Antique Stealer? What's the one that brings Legacy? Yeah, uh, and yeah you the can Antique get your, your auto get encoder. <laughs> just, no, I can't it's... wait for the. Legacy yeah. Maverick auto encoding change. <laughs> it's going to be great. Yeah. You're li- living your best life, discarding all of your creatures. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So that was that was just a weird, you know, let's, let's just talk about Whirlpool for a second. Like, we don't have to go too deep into this, but it was one of the first games I played of, Winds of, of uh, Dark Tidings was a Whirlpool. And the first time that the TCO prompt gave me the option of choosing one of six houses, I was hooked. Mm-hmm. I was like, I, I think I saved that screenshot. I was like laughing out loud. It was just such a ridiculous situation. And I'm pretty sure that game, I called some houses that were not on my Archon card. And like, 
that's often the right choice in those kind of situations. You, you never know. And so I just loved the, like the chaos that was added to the game and that kind of stuff. Like it's just something that I, I'd never seen before in the game, you know, like doing something as ridiculous as that. Feels very like essence of Keyforge esque, you know, like this is the sort of, the sort of, uh, of cool, cool interaction that feels, you know, it cuts right to the essence of the game. I like it. Mm-hmm. It was just fun. And, and that sets you up to push through the next time somebody whirlpooled you one of their dudes that was in an off house and then Mark of Distant, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I've encountered that yet. Uh, I probably have actually. Um, but yeah, that can be that can be brutal for sure. Um, it's similar to Exile and Mark of Dis, which is you know a fairly common combo. Um, but uh, yeah, the whirlpool against Mark of Dis is definitely something to think about. Um, but there's no Mark of Dis in Dark Tidings or in Winds of Exchange, so it's really just something you look for in your opponent's list. Mm-hmm. Maybe change how you play against it. Yeah, extra so. discard all those creatures. Yeah. Yeah. Extra. Um, but uh, before yeah. I forget. I already did forget this once, but I want to go back. Um, I had a brilliant idea that I just thought of on this on this show. Is you're talking about all the decision points that come up, we can actually conduct an experiment, I think, to to determine this, or at least get like a a, a decent idea. We often, when we have a third guest on here, we'll play hand and brain. Mm-hmm. And to my recollection, we have not played a hand and brain with dark tidings yet. Mm-hmm. But I think we could probably amass some sloppy lab workers to play some hand and brain games with dark tidings and compare it to games without dark tidings, see how many times the hand uh, would have called a different house than the brain. Okay. okay. And we could do this over, you know, many games to get a good sample size, but I bet you with dark tidings, there will be more situations where the hand is like, I would have called a totally different house. Well, when it's one of six, I mean, it's going to be, Oh my. <laughs> I'm not even talking about whirlpool. <laughs> <laughs> But even like with Whirlpool, I mean, it just adds to it. But I really do believe that, that um, there's like, we played a game last night I mentioned where there was turn three or four, I could have called any of my houses. Mm -hmm. And I think any one of them would have been defensible and could have made a good play on them. Um, But those, like, they surely made an impact in the game. If I had called a different house, things could have gone differently. And so um, I'd be curious if we played hand and brain with Dark Tidings more often to kind of see that. Okay, we'll set it up. It'll be yummy data indeed, as uh, as Data Force Stream says. That would be some yummy data. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, I guess maybe just kind of my finishing the thought on you know home run derby versus Moneyball. I think uh, with with some of the older sets or some of the non Worlds Collide, or, uh, excuse me, non Dark Tidings AOA sets in particular. When I open a new deck, I feel much more confident in my initial read of it on how strong the deck's gonna be than I am with AOA or Dark Tidings. Dark Tidings. And uh, this is actually something that, uh, that Not Tonight and I have noticed a lot in playing Sloppy Sextet. So for, uh, <laughs> for folks who are- You can't just say that and gloss over it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so for folks yeah, who are not familiar, uh, it's uh, like six decks sealed, right? Uh, and you build from those six decks a sealed triad, and then you play uh, three fates with the remaining three decks. So that's uh, Archon Reversal Adaptive Short. And then with the- uh, with the band deck from your triad, you play a full adaptive. So for a truly marathon a session that gets very, very good use out of your sealed your sealed pulls. Um, but uh, for extra fun, you'll mix up the sets and say maybe open two dark tidings, two AOA, you know, two worlds collide, you know, whatever, just just two 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 or something, and you'll have to put one of the two from each set into your triad, and it's usually very clear like oh this is the world collide deck that's better or this is the mass mutation deck that's better it's going in the triad and i find myself and she's commented as well that um it's often not as clear or easy to tell which of the two dark tidings or or aoa even for me i've noticed as well that uh Mm -hmm. you know you should play in your triad or is going to be stronger and it's not always the one that ends up being uh a higher sass as well interesting um interesting to see yeah yeah and with the 
sloppy sex that you don't actually check the SAS. You don't use the right. FK to help you. It's really right. just looking at the lists. So it makes it even harder. Um, and it's not really just a matter of the card pool. Um, I think we're all pretty like equally familiar with the card pool from Dark Tidings and, and AOA uh, and other sets. But yeah, it's just really hard to evaluate by looking at the Dark Tidings how this is all going to work together. There's way more three-card combos involved. There's way more of the synergy like you talked about. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, you know, you can't really tell like how it's all going to work together. Um, how well it can take chains if it doesn't have tide erasers. Like, it's not always abundantly clear. Um, and that just makes it interesting. Mm. So sure. you'd say maybe there are there are more decks that have the potential that, that look like they could be more than the sum of their parts, whereas maybe some of these other decks, it's like, well, I can kind of add up the individual parts and, and get a decent sense for how well it's going to perform. Mm -hmm. You look at one of these decks where there's more hinging on synergies or maybe more more that it's going to yeah, rely on some of these broader interactions and it's kind of a question okay how is is this going to hold together is it going to punch um you know yeah yeah and not always clear and i think not always being clear is also a great thing for the game mm -hmm. yeah for sure um there's two other things that i wanted to touch on with dark tidings that i liked um and i think they're both also kind of indicative of um topics that we may talk about in the future or already have like um Skill testing cards is one, and in particular, double-sided artifacts, which we have an entire series based on double-sided artifacts. Um, to me, those are like among the most skill testing cards because they're offering decisions for you and your opponent. And um, sometimes they're discards, sometimes they're not. You just have to kind of know like um, which one they are. And I think we're also planning to do a future episode on skill-intensive cards in general. Um, and it's not just focused on Dark Tidings, but we have a list of things that we wanted to go over with um, like more deeper into strategy about how to use them. Um, Curious RS is one that we've already talked about. Auto Encoder, I think we've already had an episode on that. Um, but then there's other ones like Neutron Shark, which um, our team has called out as like a very high skill testing card, and Jargogo as well, which has a lot of weird interaction. So things mm -hmm. like that, um, those are both, all of those cards I mentioned are older sets, but there's a lot of that stuff in Dark Tidings. Um, like we talked about final analysis and the um, artifacts that are all throughout Guadalupe, like mm -hmm. there's so many things that um, I think it just, you know, test your skill as a player and help you, well, not help you, but really like test your ability to recognize a situation and know if you can take advantage of that or not. Um, maybe that's part of the things that people don't like is that like sometimes you have to look at a card and say, this is a pretty good card. But I need to discard it. Maybe they don't like to discard it. Maybe I don't know. Um, I've I've definitely had some whirlpool games where I was like, I love my whirlpool, but I can't play it, or I shouldn't play it. <laughs> I'll probably always play it, but I, I I've definitely had times where I said I probably shouldn't. Mark of Disc might be one of those examples. <laughs> yeah, yeah, interesting. I think that was actually the only thing, the only point I wanted to make. Um, you had a random question. Do you think we're ever going to see a legacy evil twin card? Yeah. Well, the, uh, this this was something prompted by uh, something uh, Ketzer had wrote as well. Um, just the uniqueness of some of the card designs that were in uh, Dark Tidings, and it did it did give us kind of this this cool thing that we could see with um, evil twins. And I guess we now that I'm saying this, um, we'll come back to it, but. Uh, maybe touch on it quickly i think one of the other other things that folks would usually criticize dark tidings for was that the evil twin cards were not maybe as good as they could have been and it was a, it was had the potential to be a cool thing but was often a letdown in terms of power level when you saw an evil twin um but setting that aside for the moment um i think i think having these i think having these extra elements that provide for for decks that are even more unique um is it's just an awesome awesome thing love to see more of it love to see love to see kind of uh elements in these sets that are you know doesn't have to be mavericks doesn't have to be legacies but are are different ways that we can have decks be additionally unique and distinctive like like yeah just really cool and yeah especially when it it makes sense for a set uh and isn't a thing that necessarily even can be reprinted like I don't know. Just just gives that set something something extra special. 
Yeah. Enhanced cards did that in Mass Mutation. Made it like made unique decks even more unique somehow. Evil Twins do that. Um, tokens are going to do that in Winds of Exchange. So like, I just really like the direction that they've gone with these mechanics. I, I think they definitely add to the uniqueness of of all of them. Um, and I believe Ketzer had also said in their notes that no decks, no Unchained decks that have been opened so far had any Evil Twins. Mm -hmm. So might be an indicator that there cannot be uh, legacy evil twins in the future, but who knows? Yeah, it would be super cool to get a legacy evil twin. Um, but I would also yeah, respect would be, if they were like, "Hey, Dark Tidings has a monopoly on the legacy evil witches." <laughs> the evil witch of the dawn is insane. So good. Um, I don't know. I didn't link one of the decks in there. Um, one of the early Dark Tidings only Archon events that Karen ran. Um, was won by an evil Witch of the Dawn deck. It had two evil Witch of the Dawns, I think two Beach Days and a World Tree, and it just did some insane things. Like it played a Brend like twice in a turn mm -hmm. and killed it twice in a turn. Like uh, it would always get things back. Um, there's just so many insane things that can happen. And um, I should have my own evil Witch of the Dawn deck in the mail right now if the airport in Milan doesn't lose it. Um, I don't know if anyone knows this, but uh, the airport in Milan where they, they tend to the international mail is where mail goes to get lost. So I am holding my breath and checking my tracking updates daily. Actually, I'll be honest with you. I check my tracking updates hourly just to see because <laughs> it's reached Milan and I'm like, here we go again. Um, I have lost things in Milan before. So hopefully we'll have my Evil Witch of the Dawn deck in, in a week or two. Yeah, catch me if you can. Fold on, filmed on site in the airport in Milan. <laughs> oh, that airport. It sucks. Um, anyway, mm -hmm. maybe that's where our dark tidings was lost in the summer of 2021. Could be. Yeah, it interesting. Very well could be. Interesting, too, that we, we talked a lot about some of the good things, that some of the things that were great about dark tidings, but none of us went to um, kind of archetypal, archetypal strengths. Like, I... I guess we talked about this a little bit with um, Anakin, but I think Dark Tidings has some of the best shadows, like one of the best shadow houses in the game, arguably, arguably the strongest, and Untamed as well. I think, okay, maybe maybe a, a key frog to Chota upgrade uh, would have put it over the top, but the burst potential in Untamed, I think, isn't necessarily even second to Coda. I think, and I think if uh, if they had reprinted, say. TMTP, it would be unquestionably the best Shadows House we've got, um, mm. and I think honestly something like that would have put would have put Dark Tidings clear like heads and shoulders in everyone's minds above uh, Coda. Um, I mean, we don't have it, but I, I still still think it stands on its own. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's an interesting point um, about the TMTP. Like, th at least Dark Tidings does have some scaling Amber control, whereas Mass Mutation only had Effervescent Principle. And maybe I guess bring low if you can call it that. Mm -hmm. um, Dark Tidings has submersive principle, which I think is better uh, than effervescent, and I love effervescent principle. Um, and then it also has doorstep, which came back, which is fantastic for Dark Tidings. So yep. uh, if it also had TMTP, that would it'd be a massive game changer, huge swing. Um, I'm kind of glad it doesn't. Um, I don't think it needs it. I don't think Dark Tidings needs it in general. Um, it's got a ton of burst of its own already. And like you said, the shadows is already very good. So I don't think it's I don't think it's missed necessarily. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know that I would say it's missed. I think uh, I don't know. I I think it would just be it would be not even a question of uh, uh, in terms of comparison, but maybe that's a big enough kind of <laughs> difference maker that it's not a not a terribly interesting observation, but. Um, but yeah, no, I mean it, it's fair to say that if TMTP were in the set, like it might actually ratchet it up a bit in a lot of people's minds as mm -hmm. a viable set. Um, you see how many like crazy AOA and Worlds Collide decks have two or three TMTPs, and you know when you go into a game against a deck like that, you instantly fear it, like just unquestionably. Like you're thinking, oh crap, how am I going to deal with that? And I think it's pretty rare to go into a matchup against the Dark Tidings deck and say, oh, crap, how am I going to deal with that? Mm -hmm. But they should. They should fear that. <laughs> but they don't. But they don't. I, uh, but they don't. Cool. 
Um, all right. Well, those that was the first two segments we had. Tie goes in, tie goes out. Can you explain that? You can't explain that. No. <laughs> um, I hope somebody gets that. I, I don't know. I'm not even sure I get it. Um, <laughs> or at least, <laughs> I mean, I know the gif. I feel like I should know the reference or where it was from initially. <laughs> uh, I'll share it with you later. Um, okay. I, we don't need to get into it here. Um, I Every time, I, I think Now in Stereo first shared that gif right after Dark Tidings came out. And I just like, I lost it. I like couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> um, then he shared it again like a year later and the same thing happened. Like I, I haven't gotten over it. It's um, it's fantastic. But that is to say that this is the third and final segment. This is going to be the shortest segment. Um, just kind of a recap of our yeah. thoughts. And if we have any conclusions to make from this. Um, where would you start with this? Um, uh, I have one that was, I guess this is kind of a, th- a throwaway, uh, not, not really a throwaway, but uh, less relevant with our, our new ghostly overlords. Um, I, I kind of saw Dark Tidings as a hint, and the Tide mechanic as well, as a hint towards a planned organized play future that really centered around adaptive. Um, I love that dark tidings embraces the balancing mechanism that's built into a game and does it in a way that coaches you to uh, figure out the value or encourages you to figure out the value of a chain. And, you know, this is always a criticism of adaptive, like, like uh, chain bidding isn't really part of the game. Well, now it's, it's kind of a part of the game and, uh, and, and really gives you some, some more natural tools for figuring out the value of a chain and, and, uh, you know, I was kind of excited for what that represented in terms of, um, you know, impact for a secondary market and things like Evil Twins kind of played in this space. Like, I'd love the idea of a world where maybe uniqueness of a deck and some of its quirkiness drives its secondary market value a little bit more. And maybe it's just kind of raw, like how hard does it punch a little bit less? You know, it's always going to be maybe leaning that way. But, um, but that was kind of interesting. I... I would love to see, you know, a return to that sort of thinking at some point, or at least incorporated more. Um, but it was it was interesting, and I think that even even in the world of today, where we're not necessarily steering right for a world of uh, of an adaptive centric organized play, like top tier organized play, I think it's still uh, f- still cool to look at DT as a set that really can help you to level up as an adaptive player um and we do have kagi shout out to kagi um and uh, absolutely yeah yeah but fudgenator taking that one over yeah love love kagi we, big fan we so, all love it. Uh, um I, I it's a great point about the chains and the value of a chain like i think dark tidings has made us think about that in other ways like one example that i come across in games a lot especially with anakim is um should i take three chains to reap with my binary moray Mm-hmm. to gain an amber and archive a card is it worth it if that's all i'm doing no probably not but what if i am archiving a very important combo piece that i know i'm going to need like one of the Faractor combo like i want to keep Faractor tucked away until i really need him like that changes the math a little bit um what if i have a reckless experimentation in my hand and i think i could immediately gain the benefit of playing the top of deck if i raise the tide there to reap the binary more does that change things at all? Like, I think all of these these different possibilities, if you have a Hydra Cataloger in the deck, that maybe changes it a little bit more. Um, they make you think like, okay, would I take three chains to do this? What about if I could do this and this? Mm-hmm. And there, it's that's just one example, but I think there's a lot of decks that are like that um, where you have to think about, is this worth it? And I, I really think that adds some great strategy to the game. Yeah, adds adds a ton. Um, I mean, before we had, I mean, what we had, binding irons, and that was, hey, card now for three fewer cards for you over the next, you know, few turns, and and that was interesting. Kind of gave you some perspective on at least how the designers were valuing chains. But I mean, strange ordination. It's just right on the nose. It's like three amber, three chains. Like take it or leave it. You know. Yeah. Um, and yep. so. It starts. It starts there, and then kind of builds up as you're saying, and and lets you explore kind of the impact of impact of chains and how how much you should value them. And I think also 
also having the opportunity to, to take chains at different points in the game is very very valuable too i mean three chains on turn zero is very different from three chains on turn 10 right like mm -hmm. and and kind of and how things uh gradate throughout um so i don't know i think this, this is a cool element to the set um i think that dark tidings also help to shape some of my thinking around adaptive in general um you know there was a point in time where i would have said well the incentives in adaptive just push you towards playing your best decks because you really want to be playing your deck in game three you want to be going first to kind of have a little bit of a chain advantage and you kind of want to know the deck that's being bid on um, and then the downside to that is a little bit of the um the uh the heightened impact of variance and then maybe so maybe maybe the takeaway as well that's a um that's a uh that's kind of a local maxima in terms of uh, optimization right and maybe the best thing you can do is steer towards decks that aren't going to result in super high chain counts um but anyway this is a little bit of a tangent but the the point was that Dark Tidings got me thinking about chains in different ways than I was before. And uh, I do appreciate for that and I've come to really like appreciate them as a balancing mechanism and a resource yeah. in the game. Mm -hmm. It's pretty rare for games to have an, like a mechanic that's built into the game to become balanced. Um, the only other like major game I can think of, um, it's hard to call it a major game, I guess. Um, it's very major in some parts of the world, but Go, I mm -hmm. think is an incredible game because it allows you to sit down across from anyone else of any skill level and have a relatively balanced game, hmm. just like built into the rules. There's, um, I don't know if you've played Go. No, I have not. You would love Go. I'll we should play Go sometime. Um, really incredible game, um, but it, you know, I don't want to get too into it. I haven't played it in a while. I, I, I wouldn't do it justice, but really to say that it's a very popular game, um, especially in Asia, and it has uh, rules where like you place extra stones at the start of the game if you're a weaker player and it doesn't hurt the game it just makes it more balanced and more fair for the two sides where you could be a pretty experienced player and play against someone who's like just learned last week and actually have a more interesting game um so keyforge having that built-in mechanic i think is super interesting somewhat unique there's not a lot of games that have that i think we should embrace that and um not look at chains as a negative thing and a downside i think they have a lot of potential to add to the game cool uh well i said that was going to be that was going to be a throwaway one but i ended up being kind of deep <laughs> that's cool um, <laughs> can't explain that <laughs> can't explain that uh the only other part i had here was um a, a topic that i already explored a bit earlier and talked about was how dark tidings is a sign of progress with the design of Keyforge in the game and what it kind of um, projects as possible in the future. And I think if you didn't like uh, dark tidings, I still think that you should be excited about some of the things that it, it added. And um, you know, if, if you're a, a detractor of dark tidings, you could say like, well, they learned from it and there are some good things that came from it that they can incorporate. And uh, a lot of new unique things that were added to it that I think are just, a really good sign for where the game's headed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and maybe that that kind of dovetails with sort of my parting thought. I I'd love to err on the side of experimentation in terms of set design uh, for KeyForge or or you know you know games with incremental releases in general. I think having sort of a willingness to experiment and explore is great and is you know right in line with the you know uh, philosophy of KeyForge in general. And I think the other the other kind of side of that is I think it's healthy to have sets that not everybody loves. You know, I'd almost rather have sets that are beloved by some and hated by hated by others than sets that are just kind of meh to everybody. Um, I think it's cool to yeah. have like your favorite sets and sets that are maybe not your favorite and, you know, be also kind of okay with other folks having favorites that are not yours, you know? Yeah. It's hard to design a game that has um, something for everybody, and it's impossible to design a game that has everything for everybody. You know, like no one's ever going to be happy with, like, you're never going to have everybody happy with everything. Mm -hmm. And so I think you put it you put it better than I could. Just that it's better to be loved and despised than just be in the middle. Because I think if you had a set that came out 
that was just kind of like, eh, nobody cared for it, didn't sell well, that could be extremely damaging to the game. So like to take risks like this and to really connect with players like us and Fudgenator and the other ones out there in Kester that love Dark Tidings is um, a great thing for the game. And um, some people don't like it. That's that's cool. Um, maybe we changed all of their minds. Um, but, you know, it, you're right that it's better to have, like, that kind of mix sometimes than to just have a, a very neutral reaction to it. Mm-hmm. Right on. High cool, tide cool. and low tide as can't opposed exp- to neutral. I can't explain that. Yeah. <laughs> well, it has come in, has gone out. Uh, this was this was a lot of fun. We should transition to playing our game. Um, yeah. Uh, do you have any, any parting words for the folks who are just here for the audio journey? Well, um, Dataforge Stream says that he thought that something that was said earlier was a great new sign-off. I have no idea what he was talking about. I don't know what it was, <laughs> so I'm just going to tell people to stay sloppy. It's probably all the, the tide goes in, tide goes out. Uh, <laughs> we've been saying, Can't explain that. Can't explain that. All right. Very good. Cool. Well, I'm going to adjust our um, layouts here a little bit, and we're going to shift gears. Head on over to the old, the old TCO, and All play. Right. So, I have a dark tidings deck that I think you may have seen the list before, but like I, I picked it out because it's just a super cool, interesting deck. I've had a lot of fun with the last week, but I don't think you, um, you're super familiar with it. So, okay, I'll try to surprise you a little bit. I have some options, um, and I'm torn between a deck that maybe like showcases some of the cool untamed things that um, that DT can do. Uh, so, but you said yours is kind of medium spicy, but punches above its weight, perhaps. That's that's my read on it. Yeah. Okay, I am going to play a very cool a very cool deck that I think you've seen before, or I know you've seen before, but I'm not sure we've played before it's amazing how many games you and i've played together so far mm-hmm. it's hard to find a deck that the other person doesn't already know you just need to buy more dark tidings apparently everyone does i mean not tonight was lamenting how she's out of good adaptive decks and i was like just open up a dark tidings deck <laughs> and i i said this jokingly and... in response but I say it lovingly now and with sincerity. She's welcome to uh, welcome to borrow Dana's egg if she'd like. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I just shared my deck in the chat. If anyone would like to look at it, whose name is not JT Russell. And uh, there's my deck, Gnor Dame de Vestibule du Chahut. Um, this is oh, my... I, do, I, do, I know this name. You know this name. This is my double Z Force deck. Have we played this deck? Oh, before? yeah. Uh, I've seen it. It's it's really cool. This is a good one. This is okay. fun. If we haven't played, I don't know if I've played against it. I'll give it a run. Um, yeah, and deck lists are open, so it's not like we're hiding anything. Okay, cool. Good luck. Have fun. G L H F. Yeah. So you've got Triple Witch of the Dawn, uh, a Mookling, which I remember the Mookling can get pretty spicy. Mm-hmm. Um, Double Z Force with all those Grand Alliance Council Rocketeer Triska. So, very good. Um, looks like no archiving, um, but if things line up in that Star Alliance, it's pretty spicy. Yeah, yeah. And you've got your Honors Kesis, Final Analysis, Data Forge, Hydro Cataloger. Cool. <laughs> yeah, raise the tide every turn, Data Forge stream says. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be, yeah, turn two, we have, uh, I don't know, three chains every turn. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Best stream content, sit here and shed chains from 23 on down. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I mulligan that one. Um... Okay, All right. so you played That's Orpheal Seas Chosen. Bad. Well, the tide is high, skirmish, and fight gain two. You didn't want to race for that preemptively? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. I'm waiting for the right time. Um, do you ever find in G Nor here that uh, your Star Alliance has just some dead dead hands with 10 upgrades? I do. So no, I do. Eight upgrades. Yeah. yeah. I, have, I have had uh, points in this 
with this deck where it's like an oops all upgrades hand uh, that happens and it's very mm -hmm. sad it's very yeah. sad um i'm gonna reap with this old patty and not okay. raise first oh which the dawn all right Lupo. all right all right keep rolling another keep witch rolling. of the dawn all right um i think i've got some decisions already um <laughs> don't you love this like i could probably call any of my three houses um I have a little bit of awkwardness in the house that's the most obvious call you can you can talk through with me i'll, I'll help you out you know uh yeah i'm sure you will um well <laughs> the pressure's off i don't need to i don't need to win this game anymore like last week and every week prior to that was a must win situation for me um pressure is off a little bit i've snapped the losing streak um off the schneid I guess as one it were. Of, yeah off the schneid one of the reasons i asked about your awkward star alliance here is because i have a this deck has some similar awkwardness with its star alliance too uh -huh. it has a really good unity or discord with tons of upgrades but if they don't come at the right time then it's kind of a hard situation so um i think i'm gonna probably regret this never mind i would regret that i'm not gonna do that <laughs> um <laughs> I'm going to just try to get through my deck. And so this is, um, you just got to play the cards. And I, I'm not going to get good value out of this, um, but I think I have to do it anyway. Um, I would, so here's a great situation where I would like to raise the tide in order to get that skirmish and fight game two. Okay. I think that's, I think that's well worth it, right? Would you say so? So three chains for the fight and the two, three the two chains. Amber? Um, and the skirmish and the skirmish okay yes and the skirmish so um, I think it was important for me to kill one of your creatures interesting um, yeah interesting don't want you necessarily going straight back into untamed I'm going straight back into untamed yeah I thought so <laughs> okay my skirmish comes for free I like that mm-hmm and this old patty usually just isn't that great. I'm still not going to raise. I am going to fight first. You're pretty lucky to find a creature with the old patty the first time. You don't have too many creatures. Ooh, let's oh, go. you got another one. Let's go. Hmm. They all get bigger, and they yep. all get bigger. <laughs> all right. Um, kind of wish, well, obviously, kind of wish my Sanctum guy would have survived. But I don't blame <laughs> you. Uh, here's a great, great burst card, Harmonic Ritual. Um, Very cool. It's, I think it's my only harmonic ritual I have. Um, decent value there for me, not too bad. Very solid. So you're at check for six. And what do you have for board control in here? You have a grand melee, mm -hmm. that final analysis, very cool. Zap, okay. Lots of upgrades to do some fighting. Positron bolt, and then the anomaly exploiter can come online at some point. Okay, very cool. Yeah, I think we're just going to. Say farewell to some of our untamed duders here. <laughs> Throw out the gack. Keep around the old patty for the moment. Play some things. <laughs> All right. Yep. All right, so I'll forge. I'll take it. 
Yeah, key for um, you, double Z force for me. We'll see what happens. Yeah, this is great because I actually have a chance to get rid of them both, and I am going to jump at that opportunity. <laughs> um, take you off check and final analysis Ooh. and an infomorph. Infomorph, very cool. Okay, it's going to be shadows for me. I'm going to steal one with Walk the Plank. My mm -hmm. second Walk the Plank will eat your Infomorph. Okay. Play a, a Villa, a Villa, or Willa as it were, Blatant Thievery, and then put a Hand Cannon on Villa number one. Okay. Check at eight, as it were. Un okay, unlikely to stop you unless I have a cool draw pip here, which I have a draw pip. It's not cool enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, but let's um, definitely take advantage of that Diplomat Agung becoming a Mars Diplomat Agung Ooh. so I can do some zapping some nice. extra zapping well zapped alright let you have a key a key for me you say Agung is that, how, is that how you say it Agung Diplomat Agung oh okay I mean, that's what do you cool. say? I say a gun. All right, fine. A gun. <laughs> a gun. All right, well, it's fine. To each their own, I mean. Yeah. You're allowed to be wrong sometimes. I mean, it's I, cool. I'm not judging. I'm just, just letting you know. Yeah. Okay. We so could do a whole episode on pronunciations of Keyforge. We should. We have a, we have a rather eclectic uh, group of languages spoken amongst our team. Uh, that's true. I've recently found out, so, uh, well, uh, not tonight has a few. Crusader has a few. Uh, so it could be fun. It could be fun. Ooh, well, I don't like that diplomat, regardless of how you say it. But I'm not sure I will have much to say about it one way or another, um, unfortunately. But I am going gonna, gonna to go wide and, and see what you have to say about that. Not much. Not much. <laughs> not much. So the witches will do their dance. Here comes witch number uh, one. Nice. Very nice. Which grabs witch number two. Which grabs witch number three. Which grabs... I mean, feels like an untamed creature is the way to go. Probably the old patty. Meliobi. And old patty. And then they are all extra fit. They're the fittest. So fit. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. <laughs> uh, you have like 15 creatures, and every single turn you have six out. <laughs> yep, yep. It's right. really fun. I guess uh, I can I can spoil it now, but it's really fun when I can have uh, witches fighting next to a Triska and let them fight and then go get another Triska back, or another witch back, you know? But mm. cool things that I'm not doing now. All right, this guy's going to have to handle someone. Wish I could draw a card. Drawing cards is so much fun. Mm -hmm. But I have to do something about your board. It's a big old board. So he's going to fight. And yeah, I don't think you have any more bounce. So let's just rid of one of the witches and turn your turn my pi sweven into a brobnar sweven for the turn nice it's even more menacing sweven for sure huh well we're definitely going back into untamed seems like a good plan what do i have left for creatures in deck just two. Okay, cool. Untamed it is. Um, I'm 
Start by reaping with the old patty. Discards mm -hmm. the Z particle tracker. Not a creature. Womp womp. Um, I'm going to assert dominance the Willa to fight oh, down boo. Swevin. Yeah. Uh, I think Meliobi can fight into a gung agu and reap reap with my witches. Mm -hmm. All right. This is where it gets fun. <clears throat> this is cool. where this deck has potential to like do some really crazy things. Um, if it had the Unity or Discord still. <laughs> All right. Ooh, we are going to damage the... That is a very spicy one, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, let's drop some upgrades on this bad girl. And tie still high. So let's play it together. Nice. And start off by playing the Grey Augur and a Cleansing Wave. Cool. Very cool. Let's see where to capture. Where to capture. I'll spread it out. I always like spreading it out. I have to check for seven. Check for seven is pretty good. Okay, interesting times. I did mess up the flank, though. Should have put the Grey Augur to the right of the blaster. Probably won't be a factor, though. So Unity or Discord has been played, so not a worry there, per se. That's nice. Oof. Have not played your... Grand melee. That makes me sad. Makes me sad. I want to move some cards. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to play this Triska. on the Willow. Upgrade on a Witch. Blaster, Blaster. Let's also put an upgrade on the Switch. <laughs> and the Wardy upgrade on Old Patty. I would have loved to load up all those upgrades on the Willow, but... Um, didn't want to walk into you, Grand Melee, quite so much. All right. Check at nine. Check at nine. Yeah, it's a solid check. Um, you have a Mookling still to come. I expect he is going to be coming out next turn. But you haven't played Shadows much. Shadows is a thing I could play. Five of your last eight cards are Shadows. So that seems like a decent play. Yeah. I think I need to kind of respect the uh, the untamed board, though. Couple threats. There are a couple threats. Yeah. Indeed, there are. Let's um. Hmm. I wonder how much burst I have left. Not enough. Most of my burst is gone. Those are some big creatures you got that I'm not sure the best way to handle. Um. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna turn cards, I think. Um Yeah, don't love this, but let's 
maybe get lucky on a draw. Um, oh, I got really lucky on a draw. Ooh, very cool. Uh, gives me some better options here for this anomaly exploiter. Uh, so let's go. Yeah, the old positron bolt. Very nice. Yep. Very good. I think, um, man, that's kind of tough because, like, I want to kill something that you're going to use next turn and you're not going to use the Triska, but the Triska does let you use something else. So. Keep your Triska. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. I think I'm all right with that. Um, yeah, that was that was a fine choice. Um, I was going to use you know both of them at one point, and getting rid of one of them at least makes it less obvious that I should take the tide. Um, so that's interesting too. Hmm. Uh, yeah. But okay, that's a, a key for me. I'll take it. And. Now we're deciding between using this lovely untamed board of four creatures or unloading some of the shadows that's in my hand. Hmm. You have Sanctum coming almost certainly. Okay. Well, we're going shadows. We are. I can get the tide on retail by first mugging this gray auger, then giving it some cement shoes. Now my Jackie Tar comes in ready next to Triska, which is very nice. Reap with Jackie to shoot your mutagenesis researcher. And then I get to horn swoggle your anomaly exploiter to finish it <laughs> off. Very cute. Very nice. That's yeah. super cute. Pass the turn. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, well, I guess it's technically not over. Actually, I think it is. <laughs> No, I mean I can I can stay alive. Um, I'm not just not gonna get any value out of the grand melee because uh, it would kill my old egad to give you an amber back. So, all right, that's fine. I'll I'll survive a turn and uh, maybe get lucky. Okay, there's a Sargassa, Zalvador. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, you are almost definitely going untamed next turn. Marshall, you are for the tide. Cool. Mm -hmm. Captures on the Sargassa. Mm -hmm. Hadroth's Wall with a capture pip. Cool. Yeah, and I'd love to play that Grand Melee, but um, give you the win. So I can't afford to hold it. Okay, discards the Grand Melee. There we go. Yeah. Yep. Okay, very cool. Well, I think I am going to go back into Shadows. Oh, wow. Mm hmm.
back into shadows. Melee was discarded. I'm tempted not to put something on the outside of Triska in case you kill Jackie Tar. Hmm. You did shuffle. You did shuffle. You did. I am going to raise the tide. Of course. Mm -hmm. Let's put some amber on my old patty. It's a good choice. Let's reap with Jackie to shoot Sargassa. Do the horn swoggle thing again to finish it off. That's, that's a really brutal horn swoggle right there. I knew it was coming. Yep. And I think put Will on the outside, check at nine. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's not over yet. All right. Submersive principle, let's go. Got to make sure I do this order correctly. Ooh, final analysis and submersive. That would be funny. <laughs> cool. So that's nice. Hydro Cat with a capture pip and the uh, amber puts you at an odd count and me at an even count. So you're still feeling good about that um, submersive. Pretty good. Pretty mm -hmm. good. Just gotta whittle down your board, I think. Okay, fights down Meliobi, nice. Okay. Three amber a piece, two keys a piece. I'm tempted to go right back into shadows. Hmm. Awkward. Did you redraw your other horn swoggle? Did not redraw the horn swoggle. Or at least That's if I good. did, I I don't think I'm not thinking about playing it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> sure, nice nice save. Yeah, you know, maybe. <laughs> uh interesting. Interesting. Yeah, the horn swoggle was big. I think um Mm -hmm. yeah i could have killed off another one of the witches but you're going to shadows here anyway so maybe not as big as it seemed do i want the tide i think i do archive a thing getting full value out of jackie here And I think we want to uh, take care of this ewer. Yeah. Burn the cement shoes. Okay. Okay. That should do it. Um, unless I draw something very good. 
least I have a, a fun way to end this. All find right. out. Let's see it. Um, so you're at seven. I only have a, the ability to capture one. So we're just going to go Logos, take the archive. Um, it's reap there. Uh, it's probably the right call to reap. Oh, well. Oh, did not realize that. That's very bad. Do you mind if I put him on the right flank instead? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, let's fix that because the game's over <laughs> if I do that. <laughs> um, he's going to die anyway. So um, I'm just going to pick one and we're going to drop him mm -hmm. back out there remove the wards definitely i want to remove my wards <laughs> <laughs> need those cards need those cards um yep. all right i think that's good enough i'm just mm -hmm. gonna final analysis these guys and um i draw the data forge and i win uh no i'm just kidding <laughs> oops uh i did what happened to my Oh man, I played the Positron and it just discarded it for some reason. Oh, did it like do something weird? I think it canceled the prompt. Uh, yeah, grab it back. We'll play here. Oh, this is this is gonna be worth it. Nice. Gonna finally get some value out of that anomaly exploiter. There you go. At least I end in check. I have some respectability. Good game. <laughs> Good game. <laughs> Good game. Well played. Uh, yeah, this is. Um, I did tell you before the the show tonight that this deck always like stays in it. You know, like it almost always forges two keys, um, low winning percentage, but it's always in the game. And mm -hmm. I feel like there's so many decision points throughout the game that can change with this deck. Um, but I'm always happy to like you know have two keys at the end of the game. You know, mm -hmm. like post game like that. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it was an interesting one. I. Uh... I felt like there were a lot of really good decision points. Um, I think to be also also fair, you picked a deck that showcased some of the cool stuff in Dark Tidings more than mine did. Mine was kind of like brute force the agent, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that we got to uh, uh, have a little bit of chains going back and forth at the end as well. Yeah. Um, well, we didn't get to see what your deck does best, which is power up a Mookling. The Mookling Voltron. Yeah. <laughs> Mookling Voltron. Yeah. Keys cost 16 or something like that. Yeah yeah i i was spreading around the plus one counters uh but no mookling in sight and those witches do love do love bringing back their mookling friend um yeah um uh, but yeah some some really cool stuff there i do love the witch of the dawn both the evil and non-evil version though of course the evil one hands down um but even there as well there was some some points where i think you could have made a, made a case for taking the tide to raise with uh to reap with um old patty especially if you have this big untamed board and your plan is to just keep reaping out you know maybe you can afford to shed chains while you're reaping out and possibly dig deeper with the old patty um yeah, i was gonna say do you ever use the old patty for efficiency to just like get to your shuffle again and try mm -hmm. to find certain things um, that you've already played perhaps yeah happy to happy to do both and um it's it's a it's a really cool card in this deck especially if you have if you have the witch out um am i right remembering that you can put things in ready next to the witch with old patty or they just put into play play each creature discard the way so you get the play effects of the creatures that come in with old patty as well right so um so witches that show up via old patty um okay. Uh, trigger and pull things back which is very cool uh, if you old patty something in next to um next to uh, uh triska coming in ready is very cool and there's just a lot of a lot of things that really um reward you for fighting right so you've got the villas in there that are happy to fight um the upgrades making fighting even better and uh, i mean obviously the z-force but you've also got um oh the untamed action that 
uh, readies and fights with a creature with skirmish, giving it skirmish as well. Assert dominance. Assert dominance yeah. is just great here with triple triple willa. Um, yeah, triple that came in big. Mm -hmm. um, if I could have survived one more turn, like I think if you had, and I could have at least drawn to like try to find something. But like this deck has outs at the end of the games like that. If mm -hmm. if I have some amber, like the final analysis into Data Forge or Honor's Kesis, like is a thing. And yeah. uh, I pulled it off last week with um, off of it, uh, off of it together. I had a um, Agung that drew with its draw pip. It drew the um, Honor's Kesis, played a couple <laughs> of the cards, played it together. Um, I think I played a Cleansing Wave to gain like four, and then I played the Honor's Kesis after that. So like, it it can do some crazy things if it gets it in the right order. But um, you know. I haven't really figured out yet if it's something that I should lean into or if it's more of like drawing the right cards in the right order. Yeah, interesting to, interesting to say. I do think there's there's got to be, maybe it hasn't been scanned yet, maybe it hasn't been printed, but there has to be some some OTK, Data uh, data Forge, Final Analysis, um, Think Twice, Honor's Kesis, Final Analysis decks out there. Um, well, <laughs> I don't know if you saw this, but the deck that you were showing on stream at the start of the show tonight yeah is an otk deck it does do that with the library this is the last mother's deck uh mark tiger deck. yeah 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 uh and this it's, does have um, data forge phase shift library card okay so, so the, this the first draws time i played card. it mm -hmm. yeah I, I played against it i forget what i was playing with i think i was playing with anakin and i was just cruising i was like this, this is an easy win like he wasn't really doing much he was just playing a few creatures and like not getting much amber i was like easy peasy and then all of a sudden he popped the, the library card and i started to see what was happening <laughs> and there was playing tell mage steel hearts that had like a 30 power and then a phase shift into wait not waste not and then obviously with the um library card he's he's drawing everything and you play the data forge for free and you just otk off that it was i i, I laughed i i was just like I'm not even mad, man. That was like <laughs> super cool to watch that. Um, I mean, I wasn't really looking for that combo, but uh, when it started to happen, I was like, oh, so this deck is not just like bad and playing a few cards. And... <laughs> I thought, I thought we were just dirtling around having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, uh, um, this is kind of my, my take on that. I've tried to make it work, but the other two houses are just, just plain bad. Um, but it has, yeah, the data forge, uh, final analysis, honor skesis, double phase shift things twice, and Eddie for some archiving, but just not enough support to really set it up. Um, yeah. but it could be really cool. It was, uh, as, as we were kind of initially, uh, doing some theory crafting on, um, actually I might've put this in, this might've been a deck that I borrowed the logos pod from when we did our, I was um, just going to say, there's always Alliance. Yep, on our Alliance episode. Mm -hmm. What's the size on that Sanctum? On the Sanctum, it comes in at 19. 19. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely some cool final analysis Data Forge combos. Um, I've had, I think I've had more Data Forges live in Dark Tidings than I have in uh, in other sets. But I know there's some like really good Data Forge decks in Worlds Collide, but... Um, mm -hmm. I don't have them. Yeah. I I yeah. Russell the Magician hits a pretty consistent data forge. Um but I do love the I do love the um phase shift punk final analysis combo that we see in Dark Tidings. Um uh Garvey Garvey does that with uh the final analysis phase shift punctuate equilibrium which is which is particularly backbreaking on a uh, groundbreaking discovery turn um <laughs> yeah really fun it's almost but, a win more situation almost a win more but oh does it feel good <laughs> you know oh yeah yeah <laughs> it's like I, I do similar things with anakin where it's like some turns you can phase shift into a brand and then pull off the groundbreaking discovery and kill your key frog at the same time to like steal all their amber unforge their key and forge your own for the win and you're just like i didn't need to unforge your key there <laughs> but it felt really good well you you did something similar in one of your um your uh nkfl matches where you won right after uh 
what's the the discard that unforges one of their keys until you create kill a creature oh uh, turnkey turnkey yeah and it's like sorry for your your key differential but <laughs> turnkey it's takes true. a key <laughs> He did. I, I I never got any value out of Turnkey, but in NKFL, your keys allowed are a tiebreaker. And I was like, make sure when you report that match, you remember that Turnkey right there. Because <laughs> I hadn't forged a key, turnkey and he couldn't kill it before I forged key three. Although interesting, um, do the if you win after getting Turnkeyed, do you count four keys for the tiebreaker? Maybe you should. You don't, but maybe you should. No. You win. Oh no, you don't. No. Yeah, you definitely don't. Oh no, but no. it's just funny. Uh, you have a deck with break key that can unforge like three yeah. or four times in a game. Yeah, that's that's a very fun deck. One that I'm putting on my list to play some more. Um, Welp. Welp. Muted. <laughs> Mutant World Regent. Oh, yes. Hall of Fame name as well. Yeah. Yeah. Break key and tons of tons of stalling. <laughs> you just forge your keys. I'll unforge them. I'll archive all my stuff, do double animator things. It's fun, a fun deck. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Well. All right. Well, it's no wonder this was a long one tonight. It was one of our favorite topics. Mm -hmm. I have to admit, I thought we were going to stall out early on the bad things that, or the the quote unquote bad things about Dark Tidings. Um, but I guess we, we did a good job playing Devil at, Devil's Advocate. Um, we also talked about it, the good things in that same intermixed conversation. Yeah. It was yeah. hard to not, you know, like couldn't resist sure. the urge. So, so DT best set question mark best set DT best set oh, okay. exclamation point. Okay, accepting AOA absolutely. Mm. <laughs> oh, I just hope that people don't continue to talk down on dark tidings. Um, you know, Murph made some really good points. Um, in a chat we had with him before about um you know the negativity that surrounds that is um you know there's not a whole lot of negativity in the keyforge community it's a really great group of people and it seems like dark tidings brought out the worst in some people and i don't know why um it's fine to not like the set like it's cool um mm -hmm. it was just kind of it, it was definitely unusual to see like the negativity that surrounded it when so many other people like us, um, just you know, having fun, just playing key forge, just forging those keys, you know. Yeah, so. yeah. I don't know. Struck a struck a discordant chord, discordant chord note, um, with some folks, but yeah, we'll see. All right. Well, I'll uh, resume my winning streak next week. <laughs> Till then. Until then, everybody, uh, thanks for thanks hanging for out with us. And yeah, next time. <laughs>